I welcome everyone to a glorious combined service today in Jesus' name. I pray that all the questions in your heart will be answered. Answered with prayer. Answered with miracle. Answered with heaven's supply in Jesus' name. Today will be a happy day in your life. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Whenever we come to the house of the Lord, there should be joy, there should be peace, there should be love, and there should be fellowship. And I welcome you to a glorious fellowship this year and this month, the first day of the new month. Aren't you happy you are here? Say, I'm happy I'm here. And the happiness will continue your life in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for bringing us together. What a glorious day and what a happy day. We're asking, oh Lord, that your blessing will enrich every life today in Jesus' name. Answer the questions of our hearts and the confusion that will be in any heart. Clear it away in Jesus' name. And we pray that your blessing will rest and abide on everyone. We'll carry your blessing from here to our houses, to our places of work, to everywhere we go in Jesus' name. 2020 year is a year of confirmation of your power in every life. Lord, we believe. We believe your word. We believe your truth. And we believe your prophets. And we believe the totality of your word. We will prosper in Jesus' name. And we will be preserved and established in Jesus' name. Anything, everything contrary to our spiritual total progress, cancel everything in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody shout. God bless you. We're coming to third John. The third the epistle of John. And we're reading from verse 1 to verse 2. John, third John, only one chapter, verses 1 and 2. The elder unto the well-beloved girls, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. I thought somebody would say amen. amen. And be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. It will be confirmed in Jesus' name. The apostle has become old by now. The Lord James tell us it was 90 years and above when he wrote this epistle, this letter to a man, a brother, a leader, a well-beloved named Gaius. It was a personal letter written to him. But everything the apostle wrote privately is available for the public. There are some people, they call them leaders. What they do privately, you cannot tell in public. What they write privately, you cannot show it to the public. What they text, what they email, to, the, to a private person, you cannot show it in the open. It will embarrass them. It will say, uh -huh. So this is what a pastor, an overseer, an elder is writing to somebody. But in the case of John, nothing hidden, no secret. And so the letter became something available to the church and eventually became part of the canon of scripture. He uses the word beloved, was writing to somebody who loved God, a person who was beloved of God. Look at verse 11. 
in verse 11 beloved follow not that which is evil he called him beloved again it's interesting for us to understand that the apostle never had any connection with anyone who is not a beloved of the lord who are your friends who are your companions who are your intimate people that you interact with are they beloved to the lord john the apostle distinguished himself that he will not have any contact he will not have any friendship he will not have any association with anyone that is not beloved of god and then you understand the apostle is with the truth he believes the truth he wrote the truth he delighted in the truth and he embraced the truth and he walked in the truth and the people he wrote to they were the people that loved the truth and they were the people that also walked in the truth look at first so john chapter one verse one the third epistle of john chapter one verse one the elder unto the well-beloved girls whom i love in the truth i emphasize the truth anyone who is not walking in the truth who have no connection together i love girls in the truth and let's look at uh, that uh, same chapter verse 3 it says in verse 3 for i rejoice greatly when thy, the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee of the truth that is in thee even as thou walkest in the truth i'm writing to you in fact i'm connected with you for one single reason that you accept the truth you do not modify the truth you do not change the truth you abide in the truth and uh, you are walking it look at verse 4 i have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in the truth some elderly people only take joy if you send bottles of wine to them and you say i'm so happy i have no greater joy than to see that my children remember me and they send non-alcoholic wine unto me not john john said i'm not thinking of the physical i'm not thinking of the natural the great joy i have and the great delight i have is to hear and to know and to see and to perceive my children are walking in the truth and that should be our joy that should be our concern the older we get that we don't have any association with anyone that despises the truth that disobeys the truth that disregards the truth but has his mind his heart his will his progress based and centered on the truth look at verse 8 verse 8 we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth that's the emphasis of elderly apostle john that we will be fellow helpers of those who are walking in the truth look at verse 12 in verse 12 demetrius has good report of all men and of the truth of all men but their testimony is nothing if the truth does not support what the testimonies are saying as testimony and good report of all men and of the truth itself yea and we also bear record and ye know that our record is true but we don't ever deal with deception our record our testimony our proclamation is truth we don't ever deal with anything that is false our testimony our record is truth as you look at this chapter a lot in the chapter and i pray that the blessing out of the chapter will jump out and jump into your heart 
that the blessing in the world, the promise in the world, the prosperity in the world, the progress in the world will belong to every one of us as we take the word of God to heart in Jesus' name. I'm talking to you today on the believer's pursuit of rewardable progress. Rewardable progress. There are some kinds of progress that heaven will frown at. There are some kinds of progress that heaven cannot bless. There are some kinds of progress that heaven, God, cannot reward. We're talking of rewardable progress. The believers pursuit. What you are running after. What you are seeking after. And what you are praying about. And what you are holding on to. The believers pursuit of rewardable progress. Point number one. True prosperity and fellowship in the truth. True prosperity while you fellowship in the truth. You don't have to go to error, falsehood, occultism, darkness, compromise, bribery, corruption, and say, I want prosperity. We have prosperity as we fellowship in the truth. True prosperity and fellowship in the truth. Point number two, the tenacious pursuit of fellow helpers of the truth. There are people, they've been searching for the truth. Their hearts have been yearning after the truth. And then they discover the truth in its entirety, in its totality, in its completeness. They say this is a saving truth, sanctifying truth, empowering truth. This is eternal truth. And they become fellow helpers of the truth the tenacious pursuit of fellow helpers of the truth point number three the terrible personality of fears hinders of the truth unfortunately not everybody is a fellow helper fellowshipping fellowshipping ways the people who uphold the truth there are those who hinder the truth. There are those who suppress the truth. There are those who deny the truth. There are those who chase away the people who hold on the, onto the truth. The terrible personality of fears, hinders of the truth. You'll not be a hinderer, you'll be a helper. I will be a helper. Somebody there, I will be a helper. Helper of the truth in Jesus' name. Let's come to number one, true prosperity and fellowship in the truth. We're looking at verses one to four. Look at verses one to four here. The elder unto the world, beloved girls, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, that thou, that my children walk in the truth. As you look at those four verses, let me clear up three things for you. Number one, proper prosperity. Number two, perilous prosperity. Number three, pro pro um, proportional prosperity. Number one is proper prosperity. What's proper prosperity? When your prosperity is all around, when your prosperity is not one, not one sided, when your prosperity is balanced. Look at that again. We're looking at verse two, beloved. 
I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. That's proper prosperity. When spiritually you are prospering, materially you are prospering, in your family, domestically you are prospering, professionally you are prospering. Every area of your life has a touch of heaven's prosperity. Not only money, but no manners. Not only money, but there is no good marriage. Not only money, and then there is uh, no maturity. Not only money, and then your life is in shambles. Not only money, and then your wife or your husband can see the effect and the care of that money in their lives. Not only money, and then your friends are people who are on their way to hell. Not only money, but your soul, your work, your, your, the, everything you're handling in your life, everything as you look at it from the spiritual perspective, everything is profitable. In Job chapter 36, Job chapter 36, and I'm reading from verse 11. In Job chapter 36, verse 11, if they obey and serve him, their obedience, they're rich in obedience. They reach in service. Not that you know you are pursuing money at the expense of serving the Lord, at the expense of evangelism, at the expense of being a profitable member, worker, minister in the church of God. If they obey and serve Him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. I pray God will help you to balance up prosperity in your life in Jesus' name. In Psalm 35, Psalm 35, we're looking at verse 27. Psalm 35, reading from verse 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause, yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. He's still a servant of God. He's still a saint of God. He's still a child of God. His spiritual life is prospering. His spiritual life is making progress. And God delights in the prosperity of such people. I pray God will delight in your prosperity. It will prosper the work of your hand. He'll be so happy with you. He will say, all that you are asking, I have given you. And even the things you have not asked, He will give you in Jesus' name. And look at Jeremiah chapter 33, Jeremiah chapter 33, and I'm reading from verse 9. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear of all the good that I do unto them. All the good that I do unto them is going to do you good. And they shall, and they uh, shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. It's God Himself that will do it. Prosperity, prosperity for the believer there in my front in Jesus' name. Everyone, where are you? The Lord will prosper you. Number two. There is perilous prosperity. There is perilous prosperity. The kind of prosperity that destroys a man, that damns his soul. The kind of prosperity that you have to throw away salvation to have that prosperity. Perilous. You have to throw away your heart to get that prosperity. Perilous. You have to throw away your church, your Bible, to have that prosperity. Prosperity. Perilous prosperity. You have to throw away common sense to, to have that prosperity. Perilous, dangerous prosperity. 
God will take very lost prosperity away from you. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm reading from verse uh, 30. Proverbs chapter 1. We're reading from verse 30. It says in verse 30, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple, simple turn, the foolish, the unintelligent, the one that is so much pursuing money and he forgets marriage and forgets the manner of the Christian. It says, for the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. I pray money will not dis will destroy you. Business will not destroy you. Running after the jewels in the city, he has got it, I must have it. He's got it, but he doesn't have church. It's got it, he doesn't have religion. It's got it, he doesn't have Bible. It's got it, he doesn't even have any principle. It's got it, but he doesn't have a good family. It's got it, but he doesn't have heaven. You will not run after the people that have got money and they've not got heaven in Jesus' name. Heaven is your goal. Whatever will take heaven away from you, God forbid it in your life in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. Buildeth his business by unrighteousness. And buildeth his factory by unrighteousness. He buildeth his company by unrighteousness. Who unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong that useth his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him not for his work. He used the services of other people. He no wants to get rich. All those other people, they are fortunate working with him, working for him. He's so clever, devilishly clever, that he knows how to cheat. You know, those who are working with him, very lost um, prosperity. I will not have that. Look at verse 17. And thine, but thine eyes and thine heart are not for thy... And, and not but for thy covetousness, and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence, and to do it. Look at verse 21. I speak unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou saidst, I will not hear. I spoke unto you, come unto me in your prosperity. No God, I don't have chance to come now. No Christ, I don't have to come now. Repent, believe, get saved. No God, I don't have time for repentance now. I don't have time for salvation now. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but thou will not hear any prosperity that will block your ear from hearing the voice of God. May God take that prosperity away from you. Any progress, any success, any money, any business that will take you away from God and take God away from you. May God take it away from you in Jesus' name. There is clean prosperity and there is profitable prosperity and there is proper prosperity. A kind of prosperity that makes you to still abide in the Lord. God will prosper you. Look at verse 21. I speak unto thee in thy prosperity, and thou saidst, I will not hear. This has been thy manner from thy youth, and that thou obeyest not my voice. Look at an unfortunate man. 
in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Very loss for uh, prosperity. In Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he speak a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my pants and build greater and there will I bestow all my goods and my and all my fruits and I will say to my soul soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years take thine ease eat drink and be merry no thinking of God no thinking of church no thinking of righteousness no thinking of the future no thinking of heaven no thoughts about the children, no thoughts about the wife. I, 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 I will build greater, I will enjoy life, I will say to my soul, take thine ease, eat and drink. Verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, I pray you'll not be a fool. Somebody can have prosperity and be foolish. Somebody can have prosperity and be thoughtless. Somebody can have prosperity and be unrighteous. Somebody can have prosperity and not have salvation. God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Number three, prop proportional prosperity. What does that mean, proportional prosperity? Come back to third John, and we're reading from verse two. Proportional, proportional to your spiritual life. Proportional to your spiritual progress proportional to your desire for heaven. You are not overburnt one side and raw on the other side. You are not clever on one side and clueless on the other side. Everything in your life, spiritual, material, financial, everything is balanced up. Look at verse 2 there, beloved. I wish above all things, number one, that thou prosper. Number two, that thou be in health. You know, there are people who are, you know, they have money. They don't have good health. They don't eat well. They don't sleep well. They don't, um, you know, relax well. They don't recuperate. They expend energy, energy, energy. And they do this, they jump here, they jump there, and they're everywhere. And yet, they're not very healthy. The Lord is talking about proportional prosperity. That you prosper materially, and in the same way, your health matches your prosperity. It says that you prosper, and you be in health, even as thy soul prospered. You still understand the definition and description of salvation. You still understand the definition and the description of sanctification. You still understand your soul must keep on prospering. You don't go up in business and go down in spirituality. It's a balanced thing and it's proportional. Look at those two little words there, even us. Even as, even as thy soul prospereth. That's what the Lord is interested in, even as, even as. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
and I'm reading from verse 1. Even as, even as, don't allow prosperity to go beyond your health, even as you are healthy. Don't allow prosperity to go beyond your spiritual standing, even as your soul prospereth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow ye, be ye followers of me, even as, even as, even as. Don't say, he did it, I must do it. He got it, I must get it, even as. He is taking care. He knows how he takes care of his own spiritual life. How he takes care of his own family. How he carries everybody along. How he is training his children. How he is bringing up his children. He is prospering. He balances up everything. And then you say, I'm running after him. No, you cannot. You don't know he balances up his life, even as I'm also of Christ, also of Christ. I pray the Lord will help us to balance it up. Say a good, good amen now. Yeah. You know, there are people who look at, you know, in that other place, they emphasize prosperity. Well, they emphasize prosperity. I don't know whether you know that a lot of people have been in that same place and they have not even had a spoke of a bicycle, not to talk of motorcycle, not to talk of a car. You know, it's not the talking, it's what God sees that you balance up, that you love him about money, you love him about business, you love him about prosperity. And then as your soul is prospering, the Lord will take you higher. The Lord will lift you up. Okay, he will lift me up. Say it for yourself, he will lift me up. This is your year. This year will not pass you by. You know, those, there's, there's some people who are not listening. They're still talking like last year. They're still talking and weeping like last time. All that water that is gone under the bridge, leave that alone. It's gone. A new scene is going to start in your life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 7, even as, even as, look at this, but we were gentle among you, even as, we're comparing, even as a nurse cherishes her children. That must also be something you are looking at in your life. I'm, I'm pursuing this, but I must not leave that other side. I'm pursuing a good business, prosperity. I must not forget quiet time. I must not forget the Bible. I must not forget doing good. I must not forget the fellowship of the brethren. I must not forget the work of the Lord. You mustn't be such a prosperous, a big man in the church, big woman in the church, that we cannot find you in the house of God to serve the Lord. And as we go for evangelism, you cannot be around. You just smile and say, well, but you know me. Now I'm busy. I'm very busy. I'm very busy. And when you pray and say, God, I want this, God say, you know me now. I'm very busy. If you're too busy for God and too big for God to use, when your time comes, God will be waiting for you. He'll say, I'm busy too. I'm busy too. I pray God will not give you such a reply in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now, the tenacious fellow, uh, pursuit of fellow helpers in the truth. I'm reading from verse 5, Third John. We're reading from verse 5, Beloved, that doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest. Stop there for a moment. Isn't it a good thing that somebody will say, whatever, I cannot do faithfully and not put my hand on that thing. Whatever errand I cannot run faithfully, I'll not accept to run that kind of errand. Whatever relationship I cannot be transparently faithful to, never. I'll not get involved. It says, beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and even to strangers which have 
upon witness of thy charity before the church whom if thou bring forward bring forward don't bring somebody backward bring them forward on their journey after a godly search thou shalt do well because that for his name's sake they went forth uh, taking nothing of the Gentiles we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth praise the Lord if everyone here will be a fellow helper of the truth the Lord has given to the church in your private life in your private engagement and in your public life and in your public involvement if everyone will be a fellow helper of the truth the Lord has committed into our hands with all the skill you have with all the intelligence you have and with all the insight you have if everyone will be a fellow helper of the truth the truth will move forward faster. Look at these three things we're looking at again. Number one, blessing others faithfully. Blessing others faithfully. Number two, bringing others forward. Don't push somebody back. Don't trample on somebody. Don't delay, hinder, stop retard the progress of anyone anyone that has connection with your life bringing others forward number three becoming others fellow helpers becoming others fellow helpers look at verse five it says beloved that do is faithfully whatsoever thou doest it doesn't have vacation to go and do evil it doesn't have time to go and do something that will hurt another person all the time whatsoever he did he did faithfully and he says the brethren are born witness of thy charity that's charity look at first corinthians chapter 13 first corinthians chapter 13 I'm reading here from verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Seeketh not his own advantage seeketh not his own self will seeketh not her own is not easily provoked you know there are people i don't know about their testimony they say they are christians but the bible says no a person is not a christian if he's easily provoked when others laugh is provoked when others have problem and they are quiet and sorrowful because of the problem they have, it says, when well, see quiet, it's provoked. When other people are making progress, it's provoked. When other people are not making progress, it's like, what's happening to you? Don't you look at so and so? Don't you compare yourself with so and so? Everything provokes them. But you know, a real child of God, you're not provoked. Even when you see something that, you know, shouldn't be done, you correct that thing, not in anger. You correct that thing, not because of provocation. You bring out water from the rock, but not out of anger. You pray, not out, out of anger. And you meet the needs of the people. You do your work, and you do what ought to be done, but you don't have to be angry to do a good work, in fact, that anger destroys the good work. It says it's not easily provoked. He thinketh no evil. He rejoiceth not iniquity, 
but he rejoices in the truth. He rejoices in the truth. Number two here, bringing others forward. Bringing others forward. Brothers and sisters, we're all in a journey. And some of us are nearer the finishing line than others. And at no time should we hinder the forward movement of anyone. Somebody has got saved, bring them forward. They need sanctification. Somebody is honest and holy, bring them forward. They need power with that purity. Somebody is baptized in the Holy Ghost, bring them forward. They need the gifts of the Spirit. Somebody has gifts of the Spirit, bring them forward. They need to know what to do to be of benefit to the people who are suffering. Somebody is doing good, bring them forward and make them do better. We're coming to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. In your life, in your endeavor, in your counseling, in your teaching, in your encouragement, in your admonition, bring others forward. In your house fellowship, in your own family, in your own community, anywhere you find yourself, I'm here for one purpose. I must bring others forward. Look at chapter 14 of Exodus. I'm reading from verse 15. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak to the children of Israel that, tell me, tell me, tell me, that they go forward. Don't allow anybody you know to look back to Egypt. God has brought them across your path. Whatever they have done, whatever they have not done, they might have cried unnecessarily. They might have shown weakness of faith unnecessarily. But when they come in contact with you, the Lord says, tell them that the children of Israel shall go forward. All right, I'm going to obey the Lord. Brother, go forward. Sister, go forward. That's not enough, brethren. There's a Red Sea in front. You must do something. While you say, go forward, clear the way for them. When you say go forward, take every obstacle in their way as much as it lies in your power. Take every obstacle away. Okay, brother, they said we should encourage everybody go forward. So I come to tell you, go forward. Open the door you had closed before. Clear the stumbling block you put in his way and show something, do something that makes the person to see the clearness and the clarity of the way to move forward. You tell your wife, move forward, clear the way. You tell your husband, I'm now supporting you. I'll be your helpmate. Go forward. My sister, clear the way. You tell your parents, I'm your child. I will not hinder you. Daddy, mommy, go forward, clear the way, every obstacle in their way that will not allow them to move forward, clear the way. Look at verse 16, but lift up thou thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go go on dry ground uh, through the midst of the sea. That's what the Lord is telling us. Bring uh, others forward in godliness, in grace, in goodness, in everything the Lord has said before them. Uh, make them go forward or clear the way. Number three, becoming uh, others fellow helpers. Becoming uh, Others, fellow helpers. We're coming to 3 John, verse 8. 
we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. Fellow helpers of the truth. The Lord is asking every one of us to examine our lives. Are you a fellow helper of the truth? We all know in Deeper Life Bible Church what the Lord has called us for. Honestly, contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Are you helping your local pastor, your district pastor, your group pastor, your senior pastor here to earnestly contend for the faith a while we are contending for the faith are you trying to pull us down are you trying to turn our eyes away from the truth are you trying to discourage us are you trying to disdain what we are preaching that's not being a fellow helper of the truth are you trying to decrease the truth are you trying to diminish the truth are you trying to destroy the truth that's not being a fellow helper of the truth and then as you look at your fellow brother at your fellow sister they have restitution to make are you a fellow helper encouraging supporting praying the need to serve the lord and work for the lord are you encouraging them or you are saying but you you have enough doing already and you have enough on your hands be a fellow helper of the truth let's come to acts chapter 18 acts of the apostles chapter 18 we're reading from verse 26 Acts chapter 18 reading from verse 26 look at what it says in verse 26 it says and it began this Apollos to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him unto them, and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. That's been a fellow helper of the truth. They saw the preacher, they listened to the preacher, and they observed the preacher. They felt the power of his ministry and of his fervency, but they knew he could do more. They could bring him forward. They could perfect the knowledge of God in him. They didn't look down on him, his parents, but doesn't know much. They didn't belittle him. He is aggressive, but he doesn't know much. He's not deep in the word. Aquila and Priscilla, they took him aside and they expounded and they explained. And they declared and they taught him the way of God more perfectly. And when, verse 27, he was disposed to pass into a camp, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him who, when he was come, helped them much. He had been helped. Now he went to the next location. He helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews that, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Have charity, be tenacious about it. Pursue being a fellow helper of the truth. Bless others faithfully. Bring others forward. Become others fellow helpers. We we'll come back to Third John. Third John. We're reading from verses nine and ten. 
3 John verse 9 I wrote I John wrote I John the apostle wrote I John the elderly apostle wrote I John the only remaining living apostle I wrote unto the church but Diotrephes who loved to have preeminence among them received us not wherefore if I come I will remember his deeds which he doeth preaching against us maliciously speaking against us slandering us and opposing what we say with malicious words and not content therewith neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church can you imagine anybody like this being in the church where the truth is emphasized? Diotrephes, number one, it was domineering, domineering. As the truth came and as the apostles came, they said, no, we don't want you here. We have enough. Don't let any apostle, any senior pastor come here to talk to anybody. And he had authority, stolen authority over the people. He was domineering. Number two, he was depraved. He had the depraved nature. His heart had not been cleansed. His soul had not been saved. And he didn't want the truth to penetrate into that church. He was, number three, devilish. Somebody has to be devilish devil they are devils to oppose the truth saving truth and to clamp down on the church and not to allow the truth to come in number four it was defiant said i'm here nobody will come and preach the truth here whatever i don't tell the people they will not have whatever i don't allow the people to have they cannot receive. It was defiant. Not only that, this man was like a dragon. Like a dragon. He stood there, violent and forceful. Can you imagine in any of our local churches that somebody will station himself there like a dragon? And the truth is to be preached. He says, no, we don't want that. Don't talk about restitution here. If you say that, it will affect me. If you say that, it will affect my wife. If you say that, it will affect her marriage. And they are, they are devils. They will do anything to stop the word of God. It was discordant. Whatever the apostles came to say, it was always in disagreement. If they say go, it says no, come. If they say up, it says down. If they say turn to the right, it says turn to the left. It was deliberately disagreeable and discordant. That man was degenerate, degenerate, incorrigible. Nobody could talk to him. Nobody could turn him around. How about a man like that? And you examine your own life in the church. Are you like that? dangerous to the church that the truth is coming in and that Mr. Danger, Mrs. Danger will not allow the word of God to come in. She knows what she does and he knows what he does to stomp the mouths of the people who are speaking the truth. The man, Diotrephes, was divisive. Divide and rule, divide and rule. He looked at the people that were listening to the apostle, that were listening to the sound doctrine. He drove them out, out of here, out of here, out of here. We told you to oppose that apostle. You didn't. 
you are afraid of him you are not afraid of us the man was divisive a delinquent man delinquent man he was following the way of degradation and yet nobody could talk to him delinquent this man was not only delinquent destructive that's destroying the church when truth is to come in and there's somebody standing in there somebody standing up there it says i don't care the consequence this may bring damnation to my soul but i will not allow the truth that's a degenerate man a damned damnable doomed diotrephes look at those verses again verse 9 verse 10 i wrote unto the church but diotrephes who loved to have preeminence number one position among the people received us not the apostle had sent an apostle an epistle to the church give this to the church they need to know about sound doctrine and tell them this is an eyewitness of what christ did when he was on earth i saw it all i was with him and we're declaring this to the church and he said that epistle that letter that message with some people he will not receive them wherefore if i come i will remember his deeds which he doeth preaching against us with malicious words and not content therewith neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would forbiddeth them that would if anybody spoke up and said uh -uh, do trifles what's the problem these people came from the elder apostle the only living apostle we need to have the knowledge they are sent to us if anyone received that message it cast them out of the church but you know what number one he has record in the book every evil you do every evil you speak every action that hinders people from having the truth there is record in the book number two is the reason for others backsliding others backsliding that man is the reason for their backsliding they feared him and if he will not allow some doctrine they will say okay Deuterophys does not allow I don't want to get I don't want to collide with him I don't want to have a don't collision with Deuterophys they just backslid number three is the result of preeminent blindness the man was blind preeminently blind it was blind to his own future it was blind to the consequence of his action and what you find here is the result of preeminent blindness number four rejection of the appointed builders builders of the faith as a wise master builder the Lord had sent the word that that church and the people there and the families there will be built up. He rejected the appointed builders. Number five, he was ruling to reproduce by gods. By gods are the people that are senseless followers of an evil man, of an evil doctrine, of an evil way. He was ruling so in such a difficult way and in such a domineering manner he reproduced by God are you like that that you rule and you're authoritative and the people you're ruling over you've taken their sense away you've taken their conscience away and they become by God they're going to perish but on your account number six resisting the truth of devilish boldness that man was bold anyone that will stand at the door and say anything coming from jerusalem don't come in here i am here any truth coming from the headquarters church don't come in here i am here he had devilish 
boldness. And then he was running people out of the church. Go out. You're not going to obey me? Go out. You're not going to submit to me? You're not going to take my error? You're not going to take my false doctrine? Go out. And there were no people in that local church that could withstand the old treffers. Those people themselves, they had problems. I pray you'll not be like that. Any diotrepes around you there, what are they going to do? What can they do to you? You stand up to them and you defend the doctrine of Christ and the cross of Christ in Jesus' name. Let me just uh, remind you now, like a